You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident fanalist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. So as usual, the plan is not going to be the plan because uh, that information all got left where I am not. So we're not talking about that today. If you're wondering what, what does it matter? We're not discussing it. So anyways, um, on a much better note, I did remember finally that we have a second giveaway to give away. I mentioned that as a thank you to everybody, we are going to be doing two giveaways in Patreon, so I will be doing the other one today. Uh, That is going to be the uh, Matt Waldman Draft Guide, which again, and I don't know why this is the thing, but it's it's a skill position draft guide. Quarterbacks, running backs, wide receivers, I think, I'm pretty sure tight ends. But it's extremely in-depth. So, you know, as far as, take the good with the bad. But it's, it's very, very good. And, and one of the things I wanted to do was look at what he had to say about um, love. I don't mean his thoughts on intimacy. I'm, I'm talking about the quarterback, Jordan Love. Because, well, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the Green Bay Packers having interest. And I'll, I'll be completely honest. You know, there's a lot of smokescreen type stuff. There's also a ton of due diligence. You know, the Packers just wanting to look because... It would make sense to at least take a really hard look at the guy because some people really like him. And, it, you know, it's similar to the to the Aaron Rodgers thing. It's possible he makes it to the Packers, and then what? You want to be prepared for it. There is a part of me, however, that's genuinely afraid that this is, as I've said before, another Mitch Trubisky, and the Packers genuinely, genuinely, genuinely really like the guy. I don't know that they do, but... There is a small part of me that's worried about Brian Gutekunst's penchant for drafting quarterbacks. Not to say anybody's perfect, but um, as a reminder, supposedly when we drafted Kevin King, there was a, and this was, uh, Ted Thompson was the GM at the time, there was a contingent of people who were very, very determined to draft Deshaun Kaiser instead of Kevin King. Then Brian Gutekunst takes over, and one of the first things he does is ship off Demarius Randall to bring in um, Deshaun Kaiser. Literally one of the first things he did as GM. He wanted Deshaun Kaiser. So it's not really, it kind of both confirms the fact that there were people that really liked Deshaun Kaiser. And maybe it was the entire room, maybe Ted Thompson as well. So it was kind of like, hey, we can have our cake and eat it too. We got Kevin King and Deshaun Kaiser. But we at least know that, that, Brian Gutekunst was one of the ones that really liked the, the, the guy. Whether or not he wanted him over Kevin King, I don't know. But the point is, in my estimation, he is 0 for 1 and drafting quarterbacks early because Deshaun Kaiser was, I mean, one of the worst, just the worst. Um, I remember at one point when, when Aaron Rodgers, which, when I started this podcast, it was one of the first things I talked about and a lot was the fact that the worst two quarterbacks in football are Brett Hundley and Deshaun Kaiser. I I remember because I was so just livid with the play of Brett Hundley and how how badly he was doing. And if we could just get a little bit better production from him. The the thing that frustrated me is the the only reason I couldn't say he's the worst quarterback in football is because Deshaun Kaiser was out there as, as the quarterback of the Browns. And even after seeing how bad of a job he did, we still decided via uh, Gutekunst that, you know what, we should go out and get the guy. Now, granted, it didn't cost us very much. And and these two things are not the same. I'm just, I'm just expressing to you my worries and concerns. I'm worried that Jordan Love is exactly what he looks like, and I'm also worried that Brian Gutekunst really likes the guy. Now, remember, you know, you could say, as, as far as due diligence goes, and it does make sense, again, because this is a, a big-time decision when you're talking about a first-round quarterback, a, a potential early first-round quarterback falling to 30, maybe. You could understand wanting to do due diligence. However, you only get so many visits, and you've got a, a tweet went out at first saying that, you know, the Packers and Saints are among several teams conduct, conducting a virtual visit. I'm assuming these are all counted and tallied, and it's one of the visits that Packers the Packers are allowed. Tom Silverstein followed that up. Silverstein, I don't I never know. 
and mentioned that actually these guys were planning on bringing him in for a visit to Green Bay, as in flying him out to do a workout with Green Bay. So it just, I don't, it just feels real. You know, it, it doesn't feel like a smoke screen. Smoke screens generally don't involve visits. Smoke screens are usually rumors that get leaked out, and, you know, you just hear about, ooh, the Packers really like this guy. Well, how do you know? Uh, my sources. Okay. In other words, the Packers told one of their guys to leak that to Ian Rappaport, and of course he's going to run with it, because that's literally his job, and he doesn't know what's real and what's not, and he knows he gets used for that kind of stuff, but he doesn't care. He gets paid the same either way. Plus, I mean, that's a big part of the reason why he's able to do what he's able to do. People give him information because then they know they can feed him garbage information later. Anyways, it's going to be a rabbit holy kind of day, I can tell. Um, anyway, so I, I do have concerns about Jordan Love, and I just want to go through because I was, I mean, there were a lot of things that Matt Waldman said that broke my heart because I very much disagree, but his thoughts on Jordan Love um, made me feel kind of happy because, again, and I don't remember if I put it in my notes and I don't want to pull up the guide. I don't, I don't think. Maybe I will. But I want to say he's like QB8 for him. I mean, it was real low. So anyways, we'll do that and do the giveaway as well as some other things after the break. But why don't we go ahead and take a little breaky and we shall be right back. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple, just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place and you can get the app and try it out for yourself so go ahead and test drive u.s cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days that's u.s cellular built for us terms apply awards based on open signal independent data so go to uscellular.com for all the details all right let's start off with the uh, giveaway actually since we're talking about Patreon, let me also let you know. Uh, yesterday, I did my first 2020, excuse me, 2021 uh, big board, which most of you probably don't care, but for those of you that are draft fanatics, and even especially around this time, I think most people are. So if you wanted to take a peek, it's funny because, at least for me, I don't know about you, around this time, it's almost like New Year's because it, it kind of literally is, I guess, for the draft. Once the draft is over, what what's the new draft year? It's 2021, right? So I always make a resolution that I'm going to take it much more seriously this year, and I'm going to start watching tape and doing da 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 But I have been learning every single year, and this year I'm significantly more organized in the way in which I have it. I already have uh, 1,200 prospects. However, only, uh, I think I have 85 or 89 or something like that ranked. So I have a big board of 89 prospects. It's It's a pretty janky board because the way that I do things, if you don't know, is to aggregate them. And there aren't a lot of big boards out there. Only one of them was an actual big board. So what I do is I use mock drafts, which I know isn't a great way to do it. But since we're so early on, what does it even matter? Some of these guys aren't even going to come out. Some of these guys are going to be fifth round draft picks by the time this is done. Bottom line is if somebody gets taken early, it's it's because it's taken early. And there isn't much difference between a mock draft and a big board, all things considered. All right, top five guys are going to go in the top five. Top ten guys are going to go in the top ten, et cetera, et cetera. 
So anyways, it's it's not quite as refined as you get later on, but it's, you know, considering we're talking about over a year away, I'm I'm content with the uh, with the quality. But what I did, the interesting part about this is I put it in Patreon, but I did it completely free. It's available to the public and I think I'm going to do that uh, all year this year. Just, you know, I don't I it, it was a lot of work to conceal it and try to like slip it in here and there and I I don't know. So I'm I'm contemplating putting up some kind of a not a website because I have to pay for that. I already shut down a website, but maybe just like a blog and I'll just throw it up over there. Anyways, I just thought I'd let you know if you want to see my 2021 big board, check out the link to my Patreon. You should be able to see a post that has an Excel file that you can download and see it for yourself. Um, I also should probably let you know, basically tons of wide receivers, same exact thing. So if the Packers miss this year, they got a second opportunity next year. Although, please don't miss this year. Uh, again, running backs, offensive line, especially offensive tackles, tons of them. The only real difference between next year, supposedly, because again, a lot of quarterbacks, etc. The only big difference seemingly is that there's a lot of really talented corners. So very offensive heavy quarterbacks, running backs, wide receivers. Uh, there's also some tight ends though, that are, I mean, real early, not quantity necessarily, but there's a couple guys. I know if you even look at some mock drafts, there's two different tight ends that were given to the Packers. Not that I actually agree that that would happen. But two tight ends given to the Packers, um, just the fact that there's two actual different tight ends that could be considered first-round picks is uh, a very different scenario than what we're seeing this year. But anyways, go check that out if you're interested. All right, let's let's uh, let's do this giveaway quickly, and then we'll talk about what uh, Matt Waldman had to say about Jordan Love. Again, very in-depth information on him. And if you haven't watched him, just, just go do it. I forget which game I watched, but it must have been one of I mean, I've seen several because I... I I don't know. I want to know about the. I'm just, I'm genuinely concerned that the Packers like him, and if he falls, they're going to take him. So I want to watch him. But um, one of the games. I mean, he literally. I think he had five interceptions in the game. It was unbelievable. Bust out my little uh, random number generator here because I'm going to do this live because that's how I roll. I've already got the list of patrons, so I just get to you know go down the list, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. One moment, please. Calculating the winner of the Matt Waldman draft guide is. Mr. Thousandth Son. Of course, it had to be somebody that doesn't have their real name on here, but I'm assuming you know who you are, Mr. Thousandth Son. Good chance your name is Taj. Just throwing that out there. Anyways, I will hit you up via email just to confirm that you got it. If you already have it and don't want it, let me know. I'll try to hook you up with something else, and I'll give away the Matt Waldman thing to another person. Or I'll tell you what, if you already have it or whatever, I'll just give you the uh, Cheesehead TV guide. And if you have that too, then I, I, I can't help you, man. But uh, I'll hit you up. All right, let us take a look at a couple little succinct notes about Mr. Jordan Love. So one of the things that he does is he breaks down certain categories, and then everybody gets graded and ranked based on these categories. And then he puts little clumps together, um, talking about the best of the group, the the average group, and then the, the worst of the group. And sometimes... This particular player gets mentioned within the worst, and you get a little blurb, and sometimes it's somebody else that they talk about. But one of the surprising things is that under the worst, or one of the areas in which he was graded as the worst, was mobile accuracy, which surprised me, not necessarily because of anything I watched, but because of his constant comparison to Pat Mahomes which obviously is one of the things he's very, very good at. Pat Mahomes and Aaron Rodgers and Russell Wilson are guys that are throwing on the run and are deathly accurate as they're doing it. Here's what he had to say. Love had a larger-than-average sample of throws on the move compared to his peers, and he also had a much lower success rate. His intermediate sideline percentage was 27.3%, and the NFL average is 58%. Love is guilty of rushing his process and making ill-advised choices when throwing on the move. His accuracy percentage is an indication of such. Another area in which Matt was not impressed are his drops, not what you do with the football when you try to catch it and you can't. Talking about after you get the ball, you, you know, three-step drop, five-step drop, you understand. Now, this is something that I think is, and he actually charts this out as well, how easy it is to... uh, to coach this stuff up again i don't have it in front of me that's a failure on my part and i apologize but i i believe drops to be something that is coachable however here's his comment love has little experience with more than one and three step drops his movement is uneven and stilted and it leads to issues with his platform accuracy that's below the nfl average for the intermediate and vertical ranges on the field this is something else that concerns me. 
and maybe I'm wrong, and I, I'd have to look. Maybe PFF has some info or Matt Waldman or somebody. Actually, let me look at PFF real quick before I make this comment. But the, I, I, I don't want to overstate my concerns about Jordan Love, but I will say one of the things about Trubisky is he does have a pretty decent deep ball. So he's got the short throws like every quarterback and human being in history where you can throw a ball two yards away from you. He also has the ability to, on occasion, they like to roll out that deep play because it's dink and dunk and dink and dunk and dink and dunk and dink and dunk and then boom over your head. And occasionally he fits a really nice ball in there, but then there's just the really terrible plays in between all that. I'm curious if Jordan Love has that real nice deep ball like Trubisky has. Not saying he can't do. I'm sure somebody can go find a highlight reel of him throwing a deep pass on occasion. However, his stats do not look that terrible. Overall deep passing yards, 992, which is 20th. I mean, that's not great, but we're talking about in all, I believe, in all of college football. 30 of 85 on plays 20 yards down the field. Five interceptions, which is not great. Tied for 128th. Passer rating 95.0, which sounds... See, 20-yard throws usually have a very high passer rating because you're they're, they're big yardage plays, and high percentage of them are touchdowns. So a 95 isn't all that great. For example, I just scrolled up a little bit. Brian Lewerke, PFF thinks he's an undrafted free agent. His passer rating, 20 yards down the field or more, 103.9. Jalen Hurts, 116.5. I'm just going in order. Tyler Huntley, 112.7. So it's kind of bad. Justin Herbert, 114. So I, I, I don't know, man. It's just a lot of concerns. Continuing on with uh, what Matt had to say, off-platform accuracy says, so this is kind of like mobile accuracy, but it's not necessarily, I mean, you can run and, and have a nice base. You could also be in the pocket and be off-platform. So there's slightly, there's a lot of overlap, but there's not exactly the same thing. They put him in the needs improvement category. Jordan Love has the raw skills to deliver the ball with the range and accuracy of a starter or a star. He lacks the discretion for when to use these skills. In a way, that's kind of an Aaron rodgers you thing. Now, Aaron Rodgers tends to get away with it, but it's one of those things where Aaron Rodgers sometimes throws off platform unnecessarily. Like, dude, you're there's no pressure. You're not even moving. You're standing in the pocket. Plant your feet and deliver the ball the way you're supposed to. It's like me as a kid doing fadeaway shots just for fun. Just I'm, just because. Because it looks cool. I don't know. Why, why does anybody do a fadeaway? Don't need a reason. You just do it because it's awesome. Shut up. Uh, play fakes and ball security. He also fell into the quote unquote the worst category. It says loves ball security as Lamar Jackson awful, but without Jackson's quickness. Excuse me. He actually continues on without his quickness and hand eye coordination to adjust the position of the ball and avoid contact that would jar the ball loose. Love carries the ball too loose and low in the pocket, and he must keep both hands on the ball. As a runner, Love carries the ball too low and loose. Even when he tightens up the security as he enters traffic, the form isn't high and tight. Away from traffic, Love's ball security is wild, sometimes carrying the ball in front of his body when running away from traffic. The bottom line is he's terrible at it. It says he's had ball security issues as a result. He's also fumbled snaps from the shotgun. He's lost the ball in the red zone um, of a tie game before he could even begin the exchange with the running back. He's fumbled while trying to avoid pressure in the pocket, and he's fumbled as a runner at the end of a play. So the guy's throwing a bunch of interceptions. He also fumbles the ball a ton. This guy is a turnover machine. And again, when your primary execution is a dink and dunk kind of guy ball security is huge because we're talking about long extended plays if you're a guy that's going to rocket the ball down the field we're talking about six seven plays before we get down into the red zone if you're doing 12 13 play drive and your percentage of turnover is much higher you're a terrible quarterback you have to protect the football the combination of being a dink and dunk football player and maybe that characterization is not how you view them that's exactly how i view them but if you are a dink and dunk football player and you have a high turnover percentage, I have zero interest in you because that is the worst combination ever because it's a ticking time bomb. Once every X amount of plays, you're going to turn over the ball, and it takes you more plays to get down the field. It's basic math. Um, maneuver accuracy, which I, I don't, I'm, I'm beginning to lose the nuance in, in between these different categories, but um, it says love's accuracy level when maneuvering away from pressure is far more often catchable than pinpoint. He also gets too wrapped up in making defenders miss and loses track of when it's time to throw the ball away. Um, he put him in, so they also talk about different types of offenses that they would fit in. He says his primary fit would be a spread offense with high doses of read option plays. That doesn't necessarily fit what the Packers do. 
but you know again you can tailor this however anyways all that was just the categories he hasn't even gotten to jordan love yet but here's some comments on jordan love specifically he says when it comes to nfl uh his draft stock i understand it but i don't get it i understand that the nfl's nfl sees love's athletic ability arm strength and off-platform throwing talent and it values these skills as bankable tools worth the future investment if you read the beginning of the chapter, you know I understand that the failure rate for quarterbacks entering the league is so high that teams are compelled to take a chance on players with first-round athletic ability and arm talent, which kind of makes sense, but also kind of goes back to same with everything. It maybe is the, the reason why the Packers spend so much time going for RAS, because the, the, the hit rate is so low anyways, you might as well bet on athletic ability, which, I'm again, I'm getting kind of tired of, and I don't like that philosophy, but I understand it goes on to somewhat call him developmental maybe he's not going to be day one but over time possibly that'll pan out he goes on to say i don't get how year in and year out so many teams and nfl draft analysts can't tell the difference of the value of top prospects like pat mahomes deshaun watson and lamar jackson and players like love i don't get that they can't recognize their own wishful thinking when the when they talk about creating an environment to develop a quarterback into a player resembling these three skip a little bit down it says love is not ready to play this year even if the team drafting him creates a scheme for him now that kind of plays into a lot of what i've just said plays in for the packer because he's, he's he's a developmental guy that's not ready this year that can learn some stuff and if we're talking about protecting the football and who better to learn from than aaron Rodgers, mr never turns the ball over the problem is i don't necessarily see that as coachable you know look at mitch trubisky Right, if if we could just get him to make better decisions, you know, and just stop with the the occasional "what in the world were you thinking" type throws, that that doesn't go away. That's a mental processing flaw. What are you going to do about that? Unless there's something specifically that can be coached and taught to look at, make sure you see this. Make sure you know be, to to train them to be almost robotic with their decisions, not off the cuff. But then you're kind of just destroying what they are as a quarterback to begin with. So again, I can kind of see it from that perspective. I just I just don't like it, man. I just don't. It says he could possibly play this year if you completely simplify the offense, similar to what Buffalo did for Josh Allen. Um, he said it'll it'll lead to some production, but it will not lead to wins. He said even when you compare Allen to Love, Allen was a full tier above Love when it comes to field readiness. Final comment, he says, Love, Jalen Hurts, and Cole McDonald comprise the fourth tier. He has him as a fourth tier quarterback. Not the fourth overall prospect, fourth tier he says, Love will earn the opportunity that early round draft capital affords, but expect him to be in an offense that asks less from him than his peers and res- still results in wild swings in production. Again, Mitch Trubisky. Bears fans are not going to have a hard time pointing to highlight reels of his potential. Look, if he could if he could just you know, take entire drives, if this could be him all the time, he'd be a top-tier quarterback, and that's probably true. He shows flashes of that, but then there's just the problem of what he puts together for the entirety of a game. And I, I, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm all the way off the boat. And I'm, I'm not saying I know I'm right. I'm just watching him and saying I don't, I don't understand it. And I'm clearly not saying he's undraftable, but I mean, I, I just, again, I don't watch a lot of quarterbacks, but I'm thinking back to Baker Mayfield. I'm thinking back to Josh Rosen. I'm thinking back to a lot of these other first round. I mean, Lamar Jackson was significantly better. And I, I don't even know if I was that big on Lamar. I think my only real concern with Lamar Jackson was the concern about him running and, and getting injured and, and how typically those athletic quarterbacks, their longevity. I mean, you don't see those guys playing until they're 40, like you do with Tom Brady or Aaron Rodgers or whoever. Right? They play until they're 30 or whatever, then they can't run as much, and that significantly hinders what they're able to do. That's my biggest concern, but his arm talent was incredible. Obviously, running is just the most scary thing ever. The, the Jordan Love doesn't belong in the same conversation as, as any of the first-round caliber players. Even guys I didn't like, like Josh Allen, were less concerning to me. In summary, please don't do this. Please. I mean, in general, I'm kind of all the way out on quarterback, but just I'm, I'm. There's very few things you could do that are that are just gonna not make me very happy. I'm not a big fan of Mims. You know what? If you take him, I'll, I'll get on board. I'll accept it. You're, you're, you're doing the same thing all over again, but I'll accept it. I'll buy into the hype, and I'll get all jacked up and everything else like everybody else will. But Jordan Love, I can't. I can't do it. Anyways, that kind of brings me to a question that was from a very, very long time ago. And I, it's been sitting here because I don't really know exactly how to answer it, but I'll, I'll kind of graze it just so I can take it off my list. It says, I heard you talk about Taysom Hill and was wondering what you thought about getting somebody who can bring similar explosiveness in the backup quarterback role later in the draft this year. Take a peek at Khalil Tate. 
Imagine his size and speed used like Taysom Hill. He does have a strong arm, but needs to develop his accuracy to go with it. Not sure on where he is projected, but his stock has plummeted since Sumlin took over the program. What are your thoughts? So PFF doesn't even have Khalil Tate on their list, and I just looked at the draft network because I don't have my board in front of me, but they have him 303rd overall, meaning we'll probably get him pretty late. Biggest issue that I have is I, I just I just don't see it. And what I mean is I, I don't see a scenario in which we pull Aaron Rodgers from the field and put in a guy like Khalil Tate to run some kind of a gadget play. I'm still completely shocked. And I listen, the Saints do it, and it works. And I'm, I'm still not happy about the fact that we got rid of Taysom. I've always been a big... I mean, Taysom was the best quarterback that we had as a backup in a long time. As a, as a thrower, as a runner, as everything. He was phenomenal. But anyways, I, I just... Maybe it's just that I don't understand it. Because I don't understand pulling Drew Brees to bring him in. Um, I, I also think, not to necessarily say something negative about Aaron Rodgers, but I could see him maybe not quite taking it as well as Drew Brees would. Tell me that you can't see a situation in which you get a critical down and Khalil Tate goes in, tries to run the ball, gets tackled behind the line of scrimmage, and Rodgers just flips out. Because you seriously just pulled me from this play in which I could have gotten us a first down. And you put that kid in, our sixth-round pick quarterback, to go get a play because he's fast, and he messed it up. You took me off the field in that situation. And to be completely honest, it wouldn't just be Aaron Rodgers. All of Green Bay Packers fandom would lose it, and probably rightly so. So I, I, I just don't really get it. And I think that you could say the Saints are kind of doing something revolutionary. You've heard fans and things talk about this for a long, you know, having kind of two quarterbacks maybe even two on the field at the same time, whatever. I don't, you know, I don't know how it would all work out, which does happen. I mean, Taysom Hill catches passes from Drew Brees at times. I, I just, I don't know. It's, it's, it would have to fit a specific thing that, that Matt LaFleur has in his playbook that he wants to execute. It has to be a certain kind of thing that's going to exploit certain kinds of teams that we just can't do without him, right? They're continually doing it. But that's, that's the other thing that's confusing is they're doing something that's stopping you so if you run Khalil Tate out, can't they just make an adjustment? Or is it just that this team can't make an adjustment? In which case, why don't you just leave him on the field? So I, I conceptually, I don't even really understand it. And again, the, the, the bigger thing is for me, I just, I can't envision a scenario in which Aaron Rodgers gets pulled. And if he doesn't get pulled and we're simply talking about a guy that can be a running back slash wide receiver, we don't need to get a quarterback. Well, he can kind of throw the ball once in a while. What, you mean like Randall Cobb? I mean, there, there's wide receivers who have been former quarterbacks that have some ability to throw a football if you want to have that in your back pocket. I mean, we've, we've seen running backs that don't have any quarterback experience throwing footballs because it's just, it's just a gadget play. I mean, we've got offensive linemen catching touchdown passes. You can have gadget plays without getting a guy like Khalil Tate. And I'm not saying I'm necessarily against it, but if we're going to get him, it's going to be because he's, he's a valuable quarterback who also has these extra skill sets. And it's probably just going to be as a backup. And obviously, if he ends up being a stud, then we can start talking about being a replacement. But it's again, it's not because he's a Taysom Hill guy. It's not because I want to use him like Taysom Hill. I just, I, 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 again, I, I just don't really understand that. And I don't see the Packers doing that. It's one of those things that when the, the Saints do it and it looks dumb, and even after it was a f- fantastic play, I still look back on it and say, yeah, but that was still dumb. You know, pull Drew Brees and he just runs and he gets 15 yards. It's like, wait, you hold on. So your your grand plan here was to pull Drew Brees, put a guy out there that you know is probably going to run the ball, and he runs the ball, and he got a bunch. I just it, it seems dumb, but it works, so I can't call it dumb. But it, it just I I don't I don't get it, and I don't think it's going to happen for the ninth time. Not saying we're not going to get Khalil Tate. It's possible. But I think you're looking more at just an athletic quarterback in general as a backup. I, I just can't see pulling Rodgers. I, I can't envision that happening, and I don't envision that going very well. And I fully acknowledge the Saints are doing it and, and, and are successful doing it, and nobody's upset about it. I, still, with, with a case study fully readily available for me, I still just don't see it. So finally, I'll take uh, one final question. Dustin, and this was a couple weeks ago, asked... Uh, essentially, what are my thoughts on Logan Wilson? He is a linebacker out of Wyoming. Says he's projected to go in the very late rounds, but posted a 90.5 overall PFF grade, 91.6 against the run, 81.6 in coverage. Very productive as a starter, almost 400 tackles, 9 interceptions, RAS 8.85. Definitely no slouch in that category. He ran a 4.63 40-yard dash. So I actually, when I looked at linebackers, had him quite low. 
not quite as low as the board that I had initially had him use. So he was the first one I watched because he was number 20 overall on my big board. I put him 15th out of 18. I broke things down into four categories, essentially. The, the top category was the guys that I really like. The second co- category is guys that I like and I think have potential. Third category is what I call it same old. In other words, they remind me of Blake, Burks, whoever, Jake Ryan. Just I don't see anything other than what we've already had, and I don't see the point in taking them. And Logan Wilson falls into that category. It was Jordan Brooks, Logan Wilson, Jacob Phillips, and Kamal Martin that I had in that category. Jacob Phillips and Jordan Brooks, by the way, are, are relatively popular. I just was very low on them. And the only guy I had in the fourth tier, which is just no thanks, is Justin Stranod. But my comment on Logan Wilson was that he's Blake to a T. I actually wrote um, Blake. And next to Jordan Bro- Jordan Brooks, I wrote Burks. So that was my Blake and Burks comparisons. Now, I don't specifically remember off the top of my head what he looked like watching him, so I'll read my comment. It says, this guy is Blake to a T. I actually like his instincts, but doesn't have the athleticism to get there. Usually tackles a few yards downfield, strong to engage, but not shed. He's often in the wrong spot, better than expected in coverage, but will get devoured in the pros. He's Blake. If we look at what PFF had to say about him, all the grades uh, were already laid out. He already already mentioned what they were, Uh, but the bottom line they wrote, Wilson's lack of agility is a tough pill to swallow in today's NFL. He's explosive enough through though and offers enough as a blitzer to still be a potential third down linebacker in the nfl they have him as a fourth round projection uh the more broad description of him it says wilson is a throwback to a different era and his listed 6'2 250 pounds that's not necessarily a bad thing though in today's nfl as guys like the texans benardrick mckinney cowboys leighton van der esch and uh, patriots dante hightower have made a living in the nfl at 250 plus the common thread though is being able to add on as a blitzer and wilson should certainly be able to do that He's explosive moving forward, even if he has limitations in coverage. Against the run, he seems like one of the closest to a sure thing in this class. So again, I mean, he's, he's a Blake. And, and Blake had good years in the NFL, so it's not necessarily like the guy's going to be a terrible linebacker. And I, I like Blake. I think there's certain situations where he can thrive, but I don't think it's going to be in, in, in Green Bay necessarily. And if we get him, it's just going to be like, what in the world? We, we dumped Blake to get Blake. But I do. I, I see him as a bigger um, guy who's a good tackler. Decent athleticism, not great in coverage, can do it to some extent, but not good enough to, to actually be a high-impact linebacker as far as his ability to cover. And the thing is, he doesn't provide anything great as a run defender. I mean, again, he'll, he'll rack up the stats as a tackler, but his ability to flow to the sideline or, or get in the backfield or any of that kind of stuff, it's just it's kind of weighted out, hold up at the point of attack, and, and tackle the guy after he gets his 3-4 yards. And I'm, I'm personally just not super into that. To be fair, also, he weighed in at the combine at 241, not 250 plus. And yes, his, his athleticism is pretty impressive, at least insofar as his straight line speed is concerned. Uh, three cone wasn't terrible. Vert was horrific, 34th percentile. So, I mean, it, it, you could bet on his athletic upside if you want. I'm, I'm just saying, based on watching him, he just looked like Blake Martinez to me. So that was my personal thought on him. Maybe I'll go back and watch him again. Similar to that uh, Minnesota wide receiver i went back and watched him and had a completely different change so if you mr dustin or anybody else has a particular game in mind that you watched and really liked him let me know and i will go watch it anyways a relatively short show because i'm out of time you folks have yourselves a fantastic day i will talk to you tomorrow have a good one Bye bye